Are you all well this morning? Good. How many of you come from a charismatic or Pentecostal background? Church life. Raise your hands high. Come, don't be shy. Hi, no, just keep them up. I'm slow. I don't see so fast. You come from a charismatic Pentecostal background. Now come put your hands up. I need to see them. I'm sure some of you put deodorant on. Do not be offended. All right, keep your hands raised. How many of you used to attend a charismatic or Pentecostal church? Raise your hands up. Right. How come we don't pray in the Spirit? How come we don't speak in tongues? How come we don't see the gifts of the Spirit? Hmm? We are Pentecostal charismatics, aren't we? Do you know that a car calls and a cow cows and a dog dog box? A sheep blares and a lion roars and a Pentecostal says nothing. There's got to be something wrong in the nature of things. How many of you agree with that? When the charismatic no longer charismanias and the Pentecostal no longer Pentecosts, while the Baptists still baptize and the Methodists still have their methods and the Echia still here, why is it that the, that the charismatic and Pentecostals do not do what they're supposed to be doing? Ministering in the power of the Holy Spirit. So... Jason and I have been talking about this for, for, for years now, haven't we? Jason, is a, Jason and Judy are strong Pentecostals. They grew up in the Pentecostal church. They went to Pentecostal Bible college. Jason is a doctor of divinity or theology. I don't know the difference. Theology. That means he's really smart. <laughs> and we've been talking about what happened to Pentecost. What happened to the charis? martyr in the charismatic church. And this morning as I was just waiting on the Lord about what to share, God really strongly put in my heart that I need to share about the person of the Holy Spirit and His ministry. Because we need to be reminded. In fact, for some of us, even though we've come from Pentecostal charismatic backgrounds, our understanding of the Holy Spirit, who He is, what his function is, the gifts of the Spirit, the operating of the Spirit, is something we do not know much about. And if I had the ability to persuade you to come every Sunday until this is finished, I would really try to persuade you. But I don't have that ability. Only you have. So I'd ask that you would persuade yourself to come here every Sunday until this is finished. Because to miss one session is to miss the entire teaching on what we desperately need to know in our lives. Okay, that was the introduction. To the visitors, welcome to Hebron Christian Church. Turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6. And verse 4. Now you must know that this is a serious teaching. I even have notes. So as you turn there, the book of Deuteronomy is in the Old Testament. It's the fifth book from the beginning. And as you turn there, let us commit our time to the Lord. Father, Lord, you have sent your word to heal our diseases. You have sent your Son to save us, my God, and you sent your Spirit, that we might be your witnesses. Lord, as we go through your Word, as we learn more of your precious Spirit, my God, would you be with us in every, every respect, in Jesus' name. Amen. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 is a wonderful place to start. Because when we speak about the Holy Spirit, somehow in our understanding, we don't quite know where the Holy Spirit fits into the Trinity. And in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, God gives Moses this great 
commandment, instruction, revelation. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord is one. Jonathan, can you put that slide up? Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord is one. This does have an on button, but I think I know the scripture. This is... It's plugged in by... Oh, it's all right. We'll just wing it. You can see it. Right, you see the first scripture. You can't see anything. Okay, switch. Okay. Thanks, Bertie. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. In the Hebrew, and you can read it there for yourself, it says, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. You all saw that. Right. This is the most sacred prayer the most esteemed statement in the Jewish faith. That God is one. Now unfortunately, when translated into English, the meaning of the Hebrew is completely diluted. So we'll go through it systematically. As you can see on the screen there, Shammai, here, pay attention, take heed. Yisrael is the Hebrew name of Israel. Then comes the word Shema Yisrael Adonai. Translated, Jehovah. The Jews cannot say the word Jehovah. They are not allowed to even utter that name. Yahweh, Jehovah, the name of the Almighty, all existent, all powerful God. Shema Israel, Adonai, Eloheinu. Eloheinu is an interesting word because Eloheinu comes from the Hebrew word Elohim. Elohim appears many times in the Bible. And it is literally translated as gods in the plural. The word Elohim is the plural form of God. El is God. Elohim is gods. You need to pay attention because it's important. Here, O Israel, Jehovah, gods. Jehovah, Echad. Echad is an interesting word itself. It means one, it's the, numer it's the numeral one. It means to be alike. It means to be together. It means to be first. Hear, O Israel, Jehovah your gods. Jehovah is one, alike, the same, in unity. Do you see that? Okay, Bertie, you can put the lights back on. Why do we start there? The reason that we're going to start this series of teaching on that scripture is that we need to understand that Jehovah, Yahweh, the unpronounceable name, the name of God, comprises not the Father, not the Son, not the Holy Spirit individually, but Father, Son, and Holy Spirit corporately. The God of Israel is the Father, is Jesus, and is the Holy Spirit. They are one. They are alike. They are first. They are the same. They are equal in authority. They are equal in power. There is no difference. There is, they are as powerful as God, as, as godlike as each other. We cannot understand who the Holy Spirit is if we do not understand Him to be equal with the Father. And right there, many Christians have a problem. They do not see the Holy Spirit as being equal with God the Father. The most important prayer in Judaism, the one that was given to Israel in the wilderness and is still today the most significant, the most revered prayer or statement is this. That Jehovah, the gods of Israel, is one. Now that doesn't, that doesn't mean that, that God is not one. It means, no, that, that, okay, that doesn't, sound, doesn't seem to sound logical. The, the Trinity, the deity, is made up of three very powerful, 
yet very separate individuals. Please understand that. The oneness of God, the monotheism of God, is a mystery in that their unity is beyond anything that you and I can comprehend. We do not comprehend how unified the Trinity is. There are no arguments, there's no divisions, there's no differences of thought, no differences of purpose. They are so united in purpose, in oneness, that that oneness cannot be comprehended by the human mind. And so God gives the word echad. The Trinity of Israel is one. Because of the, of the unity, they appear as one. When you, when you think of the Father, you're thinking of Jesus. When you're thinking of Jesus, you think of the Holy Spirit because they have one in mind, one in purpose. There is no variation in character, in their deity. All right, is that, do you need to go home and just think that one through? Because it's, it's a mind boggler. Do not try to understand the Trinity. You can't. Because we cannot understand the foundation of the Trinity, and that is the unity. It is something we cannot comprehend because we cannot relate to it. Human experience, we can only understand what we have experienced. You and I can only understand what we've experienced. What we haven't experienced, we can't understand. And you've never, under, you've never experienced the unity of the Trinity. That is where we start. The Holy Spirit is equal with the Father and equal with Jesus. But within the Trinity, there are different personalities. We know that Jesus functions very differently from the Father. And so does the Holy Spirit. And for the purpose of this series of teachings, we're going to focus on the Holy Ghost in the Old Testament. Today, we're only going to look at the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Does anybody know the time span between the Old and New Testaments? Does anybody have any idea? What was the time span between the end of the Old and the beginning of the New? Sorry? 400 years. All right. Actually, it's not. It was three days. The time span between the Old and the New Testament is three days. Do you want me to just explain to you how we get there? Well, let me help you. Jesus says, do not think I came to destroy the law and the prophets. I came not to destroy, but to fulfill. The ministry of Jesus, the Gospels of Matthew, James, sorry, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 95% of those Gospels are part of the Old Testament. Only the last chapter or chapters deal with the New Testament. And they begin with, on the third day, when the disciples came to the tomb, they found it empty. That's when the New Testament starts. Up until that, it was Old Testament. Did Jesus tell anybody to stop sacrificing? Did he tell anybody to stop tithing? Did he tell anybody to stop listening to the Pharisees? Of course not. He came to fulfill the law and the prophets. He came to fulfill the Old Testament. So what was the, the end of the Old Testament? Ended when Jesus said, It is finished. And gave up his breath. He was in the ground. His physical body was in the ground for three days and three nights. But his spirit went down to paradise and to Hades. On the third day, he rose again, ushering in the New Testament age. So what we're going to be covering now, we're going to be covering the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. I'm sure you've learned something today. Okay, if you just bear with me, you can learn something more. We need to re-look at what we understand about Christianity. Because our minds have been conditioned by tradition to miss the purposes and plans of God. In the beginning... Bereshit Barach, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 2. 
The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. The introduction of God's instruction manual to humankind begins with the creation sorry the account of the creation what is interesting in the book of genesis the first chapter we have the word elohim appearing it was god's the trinity the deity all three in unity creating Jesus was given permission by the Father. The Bible tells us in many places in the New Testament that all things were created by Him and for Him. That Jesus was the Creator. Are you all familiar with that? We don't have to look at those scriptures. The Bible teaches us very clearly that Jesus was the Creator. It was Jesus who said, let there be light, and there was light. But what we notice is that in the creation account... The Bible tells us that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, was hovering over the face of the waters. We see that the Spirit of God is the member of the Trinity who does the work. How? We don't know. Jesus speaks it, the Spirit of God does it. How? I'm clueless and so are you. And whoever says they do know how, that person is a liar and to be ignored. Okay, you create a planet and you tell me how you did it, then we can believe you. The Spirit of the living God, you might say, is the person of the Trinity that manifests the will of God through His power. That's about as good as I can explain it. Jesus says the Spirit of God does. Okay. We see that right in the beginning. If you, I want to just give you two scriptures confirming that. The first is in Job chapter 33. Job 33 and verse 4. Now, I will share a few scriptures today. So if I'm going fast, just take the, note, the scripture reference down. I want to show you that it was the Holy Spirit who took the instruction of Jesus and took the word of Jesus and brought it to fruition. He brought it into existence. Jesus said and the Holy Spirit brought it forth. This is what I want you to establish so we can, so what I, what, this is what I want to establish so that you can understand that when we speak of the Holy Spirit, we're not speaking about some oriental woman that shacked up with the deity. For those of you who've got the shack, it has numerous uses. Wonderful for starting the fires, jamming under doors that you want to remain open. Further than that, it has no use at all. The shack attacks the character of God and especially of the Holy Spirit. Job chapter 33 verse 4, that was brought to you by... You can see there's going to be a lot of editing on this one. Job 33, verse 4. The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. The Spirit of God has made me. So although God created, well, not although, God did create man. On the sixth day, God created man. But in the account of Genesis, it is the Hebrew word, Elohim, which we've come to know now, is the plural noun for God, translated accurately, literally as God's. So, here, Elihu says to Job that the Spirit of God has made me, has made man. So, if the Spirit of God made man, let's see who made the animals. Psalm 104. In Psalm 104, and reading from verse 24, the psalmist writes, 
And he says, O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your possessions. This great and wide sea in which are innumerable teeming things, living things, both small and great. Let's go down to verse 27. These will wait for you, that you may give them their food in due season. Verse 28. What you give them, they gather in. You open your hand, they are filled with good. You hide your face, they are troubled. You take away their breath, and they die and return to the dust. You send forth your spirit. They are created, and you renew the face of the earth. So here again, the psalmist acknowledges that it, the creatures of the oceans are created and are sustained by the Spirit of God. Speaking of the Holy Spirit. Jesus speaks, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit does. Are you seeing that? He is equal in the creation. That is why when God gives the Scriptures... God uses the word Elohim in the first chapter of Genesis so that the people familiar with the language would understand that God is introducing himself in the plural. He does not use his name Jehovah or Yahweh. He does not use his name Adonai, meaning Lord. But he uses the name Elohim, conveying the idea of plurality. So we see that as we explore further on in Scripture, we see that the Holy Spirit is very much involved in the creation. Okay. Okay. 26 times in the Old Testament, you see the phrase, the Spirit of the Lord, speaking about the Holy Spirit. It was the Spirit of the Lord that came upon Gideon, when he fought against the Midianites. It was the Spirit of the Lord that came upon the first king of Israel, Saul, and he began to prophesy. It was the Spirit of the Lord that came upon Ezekiel and Isaiah and the prophets of old, upon the kings of old. It was the Spirit of the Lord that came upon Samson, and he did mighty feats in the strength of God. It was the Spirit of the Lord that came upon Elijah, and the man ran faster than the king's finest chariots. Every time we see the Spirit of the Lord coming upon somebody in the Old Testament, it was either prophecy or they would go, off, go forth in power. They would do great things in the name of God. It was the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, coming upon the folk of the Old Testament that empowered them to do the will and the works that God wanted of them. We see the Old Testament is full of examples of healings, of miracles, of people being raised from the dead. Signs and wonders abound in the Old Testament. In fact, there are more signs and wonders recorded in the Old Testament than there are in the New. Do you know that? And all these works, the Bible clearly shows us, were done by the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon Folk in the Old Testament as God willed and as God allowed. But I want us to move closer to the, the more familiar parts of the Old Testament. Those are the majority of the chapters of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. On our journey there, I want us to go to the book of Isaiah. Saints, it is imperative that we understand the will of God... In regards to the ministry of the Holy Spirit as it pertains to us. What is God's will concerning the Holy Spirit in your life as a believer in Jesus? If you do not know that, if you do not know what God's heart is for you and your relationship with the Holy Spirit, you will not function as God wants you to. I often speak to people and the subject of the Holy Spirit comes up and the first thing is tongues. The Holy Spirit is not tongues. 
Just like a Ferrari is not a black stallion raised up on its hind legs. If you've got the badge and stuck to the car, unless you come from Actonville, chances are you own a Ferrari. Isaiah chapter 11. All right, that one went, went over like a lead balloon. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 11, speaking about Jesus the Messiah. Well, before we get there, I just want to, you can just write down two ref, scripture references. In Psalm 51 and verse 11, David pleads with God after committing adultery and murder. He pleads with God for repentance and forgiveness. And he cries out to God and he says, Lord, take not your Holy Spirit from me. In Isaiah chapter 63, verses 10 and 11, Isaiah records by the Spirit of God how Israel grieved God's Holy Spirit. The Old Testament saints knew their need of the Holy Spirit. They knew that the Spirit of God could be grieved. And coming to Jesus in chapter 11, verse 1 of Isaiah, There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. This is speaking of the Holy Spirit resting upon Jesus. And then we see the six attributes of the Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. You've, I'm sure most of you have, who were here during eschatology, you saw that slideshow of the Jewish candelabra, the candlesticks, the seven branches, it's talking the seven spirits of God. I don't want to go into that. You can see it on the eschatology DVD. But speaking about Jesus, when the Messiah, the branch of Jesse, the branch speaking of the promise that God made to the son of Jesse. Does anybody know who the son of Jesse was? It was King David. God made a covenant with King David. A covenant that he first made with Judah through the mouth of Jacob. When Judah blessed his son Judah and said the scepter, that is the a scepter is, 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 a, is a cane type of goodie that the, that the king carried. It says, The scepter shall not depart from the house of Judah until Shiloh comes. Shiloh speaking of the Messiah. And here Isaiah is speaking about the promised Messiah that was going to come to Israel and says, When the, the root of Jesse comes, the Spirit of the Lord will be upon him. That when Messiah comes, the Holy Spirit must come upon him. And it then goes to speak of the attributes of the Holy Spirit. And we know that in Isaiah 61, verse 1, the Bible speaks. Jesus actually is speaking by the prophet and says in verse 1 of Isaiah 61, the Spirit of God, sorry, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor, and he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. We'll revisit that scripture. Okay, that's just by way of introduction. Let's get into the last part of the New Testament, Luke chapter 3. Sorry, the last part of the Old Testament, Luke chapter 3. As you're turning there, how many miracles did Jesus do before the age of 30? Anybody know the answer? Zero. Correct. How many sermons did he preach? Zero. Did he heal anybody? Did he cast out any devils? The only thing that made him rather peculiar that the Bible records was his knowledge and understanding of the Scriptures. 
The only thing that sets him aside as being an extraordinary child was his incredible understanding and grasp of Scripture. Apart from that, there was nothing that was outwardly spectacular about Yeshua ben Yosef, Jesus, the son of Joseph, the carpenter who originally was from Bethlehem but now had set up shop in Nazareth. Peculiar kid, he wouldn't join in any pranks, he would never show any disobedience, he would never try to be nasty, he was just one of these really good, sweet kids with an extraordinary grasp of scripture. But apart from that, nothing spectacular. In fact, when he comes to Nazareth, Mark chapter 6 records that people were offended at him. They said, is this the kid? Is this him who does all these signs and wonders? I mean, this is Jesus. This is the carpenter's son. All of a sudden, he's the Messiah. He's gone from a nobody to a somebody. Because there's nothing spectacular about his life. The first 30 years of Jesus' life were unspectacular. Why? Well, let's find out. Luke chapter 3, reading from verse 16. Well, let's go up to verse 15. Now as the people were in expectation and all reasoned in their hearts about John, whether he was the Christ or not. John is baptizing folk by the Jordan. According to the time set by Daniel, Israel are expecting a Messiah to come any moment. John is having this incredible impact upon the nation. People are turning back to God. They're confessing their sins and they're repenting. And they're going through the mikvah. They're going through the waters of baptism common to the Hebrew traditions. An outward demonstration of the washing away of their sins. And they're coming to John and the people are now speculating, is John, could this possibly be the Messiah? And John responds in verse 16, John answered, saying to them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. John points to the Messiah. He answers their question regarding whether he's the Messiah or not, and he says, I'm not the Messiah. I'm unworthy even to touch the Messiah's feet. But when he, the Messiah, comes, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. You need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and with fire. We'll get to that a bit later on. For sake of context, let's go to verse 21 of Luke 3. Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. Now, in Matthew's account, John does not want to baptize Jesus. Are you familiar with Matthew's account? In Matthew's account, John says to Jesus, It is I who have need to be baptized by you. But Jesus responds and says to him, Let all things... Well, he says, You need to baptize me that all righteousness may be fulfilled. That... The law and the prophets will be fulfilled. John was the messenger prophesied in the Old Testament that would come before Messiah. Jesus had need to be baptized by John, not because Jesus had any sin in his life, but it was a fulfillment of Scripture. And in Luke's account, which doesn't have that, the Bible says that Jesus also was baptized, and while he prayed, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. This happened, as 20, verse 23 says, Now Jesus himself began his ministry at about 30 years of age. You see that in verse 23. 30 years of age was the age that a Levite could begin to take up his priestly duties. It was only at the age of 30 that a Levite could enter into the priesthood. Jesus is our high priest. It was at the age of 30, although he was not from the tribe of the Levites, of the priests, yet we know that Jesus 
is our high priest. So at the age of 30, he begins his ministry, and the ministry begins with the baptism in the Jordan and the Holy Spirit descending upon Jesus. That's when his ministry begins. Now the Bible says, in chapter 4, verse 1, Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan, that was where he was baptized, and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. The very first thing that happens, the very first event that happens in the life of Jesus, after the Spirit of the living God comes upon him, after the Holy Spirit comes upon him, is that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, leads Jesus into the wilderness. Now, you all know, and most of you know what happens in the wilderness. Jesus was there for a period of 40 days and 40 nights in which he ate nothing. And during this period, three times Lucifer, the devil, came to tempt him. And three times Jesus resisted the temptation. After this time of trial and testing in the wilderness, the Bible says in verse 14, Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news of him went out through all the regions, all the surrounding regions. Interesting. Did anybody pick up something very dramatic happened to Jesus over that 40 day period? Anyone see it? It's right. Notice when the Spirit of God comes upon him, the Spirit of God leads him into the wilderness, leads him into temptation. Or to, no, leads him to be tempted, sorry. God does not tempt anybody. He leads him to be tempted. When Christ, after fasting and praying and becoming strengthened in God, when he returns from that experience, the Bible says he returns in the power. He first gets full of the Spirit, and then he gets full of the power of the Spirit. It was after his return... From the 40 days in the wilderness, that Jesus begins to exercise his ministry. And we start seeing signs and wonders and miracles and the most incredible demonstrations of God working through a man's life. But the question that needs to be asked is, prior to Jesus' baptism in the River Jordan, was Jesus filled with the Holy Spirit? Did he experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God resting upon him? Did Jesus have the Spirit of God resting upon him prior to his baptism? What's the answer? No. The answer is no. Where does Scripture record that Jesus had the Spirit of God upon him prior to this account? The Spirit of God will come upon him. The Spirit of wisdom and power and the knowledge of God. Did Jesus minister in the power of the Spirit prior to his baptism? Not once. Now, I know for many of you, you're trying to understand, but David, hold on, we're talking about God here. Yes, we are. We are talking about God. We're talking about Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. We're talking about Yahweh, God, the Lord, your Redeemer. We're speaking about the Almighty who created all things. We're speaking about He was with God in the beginning. But He was with God in the beginning. The Bible says He laid aside His deity. Though being equal with God, He humbled Himself laying aside his glory, laying aside his deity, and he came as a man. Jesus Christ was a human being upon the earth. Though he was the son of the living God, his deity was not with him on earth. He walked as a man. The only difference between Jesus and you was that Jesus, because he was not born of an earthly father, had no sin nature. 
He had, sin had no power dominating his life. Remember, the sin nature is passed down via Adam well, right through to every child that is born by a human father. Christ was born without a human father. Therefore, he was without the sin nature. But apart from that, Jesus was a human being in every single respect. The writer of Hebrews says that he was tempted in every way just as we are. He got hungry. The opportunity to get cross and lose his temper, he experienced that temptation. As a young man, he was tempted by the sins of youth. He got hungry. When he cut himself, he bled real blood. He was prone to sickness. He was prone to hunger. He was a man in every respect. God became man. Man sinned. God took on the form of man to redeem mankind. God had to be perfect man. He had to be just like you and I. Otherwise, he would not be the perfect sacrifice. The difference between Jesus and us was that he had no sin nature. Therefore, he lived a perfect life. It's important for us to understand this because God is expecting you and I to function like Jesus functioned. I'm going to say that once more. It's important for you to understand and grasp this truth that Christ was perfect man upon earth. He had no attributes of deity in him other than his pedigree. He was a son of God. God acknowledged him as, as his son. But he had no, none of his glory with him. He was perfect man. And the reason we need to understand this is because God expects you and I to function just like Jesus functioned when he walked the earth. And if you don't get it, you're not going to function like God wants you to function. Because if you somehow think, well, you know, Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit from his birth. He was God. He functioned in his own power. You're going to miss the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You're going to miss its importance, its significance, and you'll never, never know the communion of the Holy Spirit. What is then the conclusion? Verse 16. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Notice the words. He goes into the synagogue and he stands up to read the scrolls, that is the, the Old Testament books, as was his custom. Which means that Jesus was accustomed to functioning within the synagogue. It was Jesus who often in the synagogue of Nazareth, acted as rabbi or pastor, teacher. It was his custom. Is that, what your, is that what your Bible says? It was something that he did. Jesus, we haven't seen you around for 40, 50, 40, 50 days. Where have you been? For 50 days, 50 Sabbaths. Oh, sorry, no, seven. It's, it's for seven Sabbaths. Somebody else has been standing up and reading. Where have you been for seven Sabbaths? Your custom is to read the writings, to read the scriptures, to, to, to share a message. That's your custom. As was his custom. Jesus did nothing spectacular before the age of 30. He returns full of the power of the Spirit after being baptized in water and the Spirit of God coming upon him. And in verse 17 says, And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book... He found the place where it was written. I love that part. He found the place where it was written. It's okay if you can't quote chapter and verse. Even Jesus had to find the place where it was written. I take great comfort. That's why I'm not a, I don't try to drum chapter and verse into my mind. Because if Christ even had to find where it was written, I find great comfort in having to find. What was, what was amazing about Jesus was he knew where to find it. So he finds the place where it is written. And he finds what wasn't labeled back then, but was labeled many centuries later, 
the 61st chapter of Isaiah. And he begins to read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Jesus is now reading a portion of Scripture that was prophesied about him 700 years earlier. And he's reading it now in the first person. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, says Jesus on that Sabbath day, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. Now when Jesus read that, he didn't read it like this. And the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel. You know how Jesus probably read it? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel. So no doubt when he sits down, can you imagine all the, the Jews? What on earth is going on here? Has his father's chisel landed on his head? It was bound to happen. Eyes of the synagogue were fixed upon him. Then comes verse 21. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. His ministry began when he got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Jesus could do nothing. He could do absolutely nothing. Nothing miraculous until the Spirit of God came upon him. And it is the same with us because it has been the same with every human being who has served God, who has ever lived right back into the Old Testament. Nobody could do anything until the Holy Spirit came upon them and He, through their lives, did the miraculous. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, is the person of the Trinity that does the miraculous. He takes the words of the Lord and He brings life to it. How? That's God's department. Don't even try to go there. That's what makes God, God, and you, you. Did not Jesus say, I do nothing unless I see my Father doing it first? Did he not say, did Jesus not say, the words I speak to you are not my own, but they are my Father's? At another place, Jesus was in a house, I believe it was in Capernaum, and he was with the scribes and the Pharisees. And the Bible records and it says, The Spirit of the Lord was present to heal. Do you know how many scribes and Pharisees got healed that day? None. God, the Spirit of God was present. The Holy Spirit was wanting to heal. These scribes and Pharisees, he was wanting to minister into their lives. Of course, none of them got healed. Jesus was sitting there, and the Spirit of God spoke into his heart, his will. Saints, the Holy Spirit is a vital, integral part of the Trinity, and we need to know him. Because without him, the power of God cannot be demonstrated in the natural realm. God the Father is not going to shake the heavens and the earth. Jesus Christ is not going to come off his throne and heal anybody. We are healed by the authority of the name of Jesus. But the healing, the actual knitting together, the miraculous working is done by the Holy Spirit. Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. So where's Jesus? You guessed it. That's right, at the right hand of the Father. 
When the Bible says that God is, that Jesus is present, He's present through the person of the Holy Spirit because they won, because they're in perfect unity. Where you see the Spirit, you see Jesus. It is a mystery that if you go try to meditate on too long, you'll land up in verse copies. Because you cannot comprehend the unity of the Trinity. But what I want to try to illustrate by the grace of God, and it is so important that you grasp it, is that it is the Holy Spirit who does the miraculous in the name of Jesus, by Christ's authority, by the will of the Father. But the nuts and bolts and is done by the Holy Spirit. I am project managing my house, the alterations. I am, if I can use a very crude analogy, what I'm doing is like almost like God the Father. In this analogy, I'm the one that is saying, this is what we need to do, this is how we need to get there. But I want to tell you, saints, I can't lay a brick upon a brick. I have been given by God ten thumbs and the capability of hitting them all with a hammer. But I have people working and making things happen. That's the same like the Holy Spirit and God. The Father... Has got, and even this is a crude, it's, a, it's so crude, so please don't take it literally. I'm just trying to show you. The Father orchestrates, Jesus initiates, the Holy Spirit does it. Okay. So, what is the use of an architect without laborers to bring in to existence what they have perceived in their mind? There can be no Salvation without the Holy Spirit. Jesus died on the cross, but you can't be born again without the Holy Spirit. Do you know that? Thank God for the blood of Jesus, but you'll never experience salvation without the Holy Spirit. And we'll get into that next week. But for this week, because it's enough talking, I want to leave you, and please go back into the scriptures we've mentioned, with this truth. The Trinity, three separate deities. But the unity is so complete, going beyond anything that you and I can grasp or relate to or understand, that God speaks of himself, speaks of the Trinity as being one. So we, we serve one God, because to divide them, is impossible. It's like separating a marriage. Two becoming one. Here, God, three, perfectly one, beyond anything we can understand. You cannot separate. But the, the function of the Holy Spirit is to do what the other two persons of the deity speak. Okay. We never say, be healed in the name of the Holy Spirit. We say, be healed in the name of Jesus. But it's the Holy Spirit who brings the healing. Why? Because Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. He is not on earth physically. He's not on earth literally. But He is on earth because the Holy Spirit is on earth. And that is what Jesus tried to explain and I'm going to conclude with this last scripture in John chapter 14, this mystery, and it is a mystery, saints. The apostles that walked with Jesus for three and a half years and watched Jesus do the most phenomenal things, heard his ministry, heard his teaching, had the, had the opportunity to ask questions of Christ when the crowds weren't around. Even they could not grasp this incredible mystery of the deity. Of the Trinity. And at the Last Supper, and I want to just read a short portion of Scripture. It's about 40 verses. I'm just kidding. In verse 7 of John chapter 14, Jesus writes, and this is at the Last Supper. And I've said it before, I'm going to say it again because it's worth saying. John chapters 13 through 14 all take place at the Last Supper. Jesus' final teaching 
with his, with his disciples. And he says in verse 7, If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. If you had known me, you would have known the Father. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is sufficient for us. Jesus explains the mystery. If you see me, you've seen the Father. Why? Because we're perfect unity. Philip, thinking like a natural man, don't understand you, Lord. Show us the Father, and it'll be sufficient. If we can see the Father, then we'll, then we'll know we've seen the Father. You don't need to see the Father. You need to see Jesus. Because if you've seen Jesus, you've seen, the Holy, you've seen the Father. If you see the Holy Spirit, you've seen the Father. Why? Because they are perfectly one. Verse 9, Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long? And yet you have not known me, Philip. He who has seen me has seen the Father. Why? Because it's perfect unity. So how can you say, show us the Father? Now, Jesus knew what he was talking about, nobody else. And his exasperation in his, in, in his, in his voice. Verse 10, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. But I thought that it was the Holy Spirit who dwelt in him. Same thing, tomato, tomato. Potato, potato. Holy Spirit, Father, Jesus, doesn't matter. They are perfectly one. Perfect unity. There's no difference. Unlike with you and me, Jackie and I are one. The Bible says that we are, the two become one flesh. But how many of you notice that Jackie is considerably different to me? There are rumors that she's softer and sweeter and nicer. Only rumors, though. But where there's smoke, there's normally a raging furnace. You see, we can't understand because in our understanding of oneness, there's diversity. But with God, it's not the same. When you see Jesus, you see in the Father. Because there's no difference in character. There's no difference in who they are, their hearts, their motives, their desires. They are one, perfect. Of course, Philip can't understand this. But then comes verse 11. Where Jesus says, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. And now I want you to get this. Or else believe me. For the sake of the works themselves. Now the problem with this translation and most translations of the Bible, they're not always that accurate. The sake of does not appear in the original text. So if you read verse 11 and you take the sake of out because it was added by the translators, it's not in the original text. It literally reads like this. Believe me that I'm in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the works themselves. You want evidence that God's in me. Look at the things I've done. We can do nothing, just like Jesus could do nothing without the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit in our lives like your body needs water. If you want to be an effective Christian, if you want to walk close to God, if you want to fulfill God's will in your life, being full of the Holy Spirit is not a suggestion. It's not an option. It is an absolute necessity because Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, who was perfect in every respect, could do nothing without the Spirit of God. And if Jesus, who was perfect, could do nothing without the Spirit of God, how much more do you and I need Him? So who is the Holy Spirit? The member of the Trinity who makes it happen. Do we need him? Mm -hmm. Because saints, if people want to see Jesus, they're going to see Jesus in you through the Holy Spirit who indwells you. And if you don't have the Holy Spirit indwelling you, overflowing you, filling you, manifesting himself through you, People are not going to see Jesus, they're going to see you. And we're not going to be great testimonies and great witnesses. Right. That was part one 
Are there any questions or not?